Now, you'll have to excuse me throughout this session. I have very little tolerance for religion. In fact, I like to make religion mad as often as possible. So those of you who feel you have been delivered from religion in every area of your life, I might take the cover off, find a sensitive area, and just kind of poke you there. But you know the saying when you throw a rock into a pack of wild dogs, the one that yelps is the one that you hit. So, so often my intention is to say things that are extreme in a sense to shock you, to jar you, and to get you to actually think, God forbid, in the house of God, you would actually take a moment to use your brain. Instead of just opening up your head and letting some denomination or some teacher or some way of doing things or some geographical location and how we think about God to influence you, you got to make up your mind. Now, get this in your heart and in your spirit and never forget this. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is the decision to become a Bible believer. Most people are not Bible believers. Most Christians are not Bible believers. Linda Ravenhill questioned whether or not even 10% of the church was actually biblically saved. Most people are not Bible believers. They are pet doctrine believers. They are pet verse believers, but they're not Bible believers. And so we generally get pitted in one category or another because we love team sports and the enemy loves to divide and separate us. So tonight, in the name of Jesus, just receive whatever the word has to say to you and make up your mind that you're going to believe the Bible. Don't take anything I say for granted. You go search it out and find out for yourself whether or not what I'm telling you is true and make the decision, I'm going to believe the Bible. Tell everybody at your table right now, I'm going to be a Bible believer whether you like it or not. The stable ain't talking to nobody. Look at each other and tell each other, I'm going to be a Bible believer whether you like it or not. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm an audience participation preacher. I'll come get you. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay to do that. If, if Pastor, Pastor Billy comes up to you and says, I command you to lift your hands, you don't sit there like a bump on a pickle. This ain't, this ain't, this ain't public property. You have come into their house. Can you imagine going in somebody's house, putting your feet up on their counter, and they say, take your feet off, and you just stare at them? Or you're standing in their kitchen and said, well, if you wouldn't mind, come out of the kitchen, come stand over here, and you just stand there and stare at them. I'm just talking about decent and in order. Everybody say decent and in order. So you got to make up your mind as to whether or not you're going to be a Bible believer. And as a former atheist who was in jail two times before I was born again, I was radically saved, don't have time to go into that story, as, a, as, I don't know, 18 years of age at the University of the North Carolina, of North Carolina at Charlotte in my dorm room. I was just about to go to a disco dress contest. Now, I was going to win that contest. I know, you had no idea I was going in that direction. You had no idea 30 <laughs> seconds ago, in a minute, he's going to talk about a disco dress contest. You have no idea where I'm going this whole night, I can promise you that. And I was going to win, not because I bought a costume, but because I had, well, I wanna, my wardrobe consisted of what was needed to win a disco dress contest, just, just so you know. And I had this thick black polyester suit with silver lion head buttons on it and these mezzelin shoes and a blood red satin shirt with a butterfly collar that shot out over the top of it, I'm telling you. I know I don't look cool now. I didn't then either, but I thought I, I thought I was I thought I was cool. And I'd just been radically saved, you know, and I as an atheist, radically saved, born again, and then I put my hand on the door of my dormitory and I go to open the door. I get it about uh, a quarter of an inch open and the Holy Ghost says to me, "Stop. Don't go." So I close the door. I go over to my dorm bed, which seemed like my dorm room was about the size of this platform right here. So, I mean, it was, it was tiny. And I'm not exaggerating. It might have been twice the size of this as this platform. And I knelt down by that bed in the dorm room, and I said, you know, because I'm trying to be holy, 
What? <laughs> Me and God got a real honest relationship with one another. And the moment I said, what, the phone rang. And I did not want to pick up the phone. I knew Jesus was on the other end of that phone, and I did not want to hear whatever it is he had to say to me. I pick up that phone, and there's this angelic voice on the other end of the telephone. She says, hello, my name is Tara. I work for the Family Christian Bookstore in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I wanted to let you know that a book you had ordered has come in. And I thought, oh, okay, Lord, I know, I know what you want me to do. There's somebody at the Family Christian Bookstore that needs to hear the word. So I, I changed, thank you very much. Got in my civvies, I got in my civilian clothing, left UNC Charlotte, went to the family Bible, what's it called, family Christian bookstore, and walked in there. Just to tell you how radical I was, you know. I just walked in there and told everybody working there, the Lord has, <laughs> the Lord has sent me here. I'm not sure why, but do you mind if I hang around for a little while until I figured it out? And they're like, yeah, sure, sure. They're like, who is this weird guy coming in here? I hung around, I don't know how long, it could have been a couple of hours, and a gentleman came in who had just newly been born again, and I began to talk with him, and this is, this is the Tara who was on the other end of the phone. If you don't know where this is going, I'm just kind of giving away a little bit. So I, 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 Tara's talking with him, and I begin to talk with him, so we're discipling him. The bookstore goes to close, so we're not done ministering to him. So Tara and I and another individual and he, we went across the street to Red Lobster. This was some time ago at Redmond Square in Charlotte, North Carolina, off of Albemarle Road. I don't know if you people know where that is. And there used to be a Grady's there, which was a steakhouse, and, and there was a cafe cafe, a nice cafe coffee. This was before Starbucks even existed, and there was an actual great coffee house there in Redmond Square, and right next to the coffee house, there was this bookstore, and we were done, and we went across the street to Red Lobster, and we were talking there about the things of God, and Red Lobster decided to close, and we just weren't done talking, so we said, who wants to go to Waffle House? And nobody wanted to go to Waffle House except me and Tara, so we went to Waffle House. By 10 a.m. the next morning, we left Waffle House, and we knew that night by the Holy Ghost that we would be married. Now more than a quarter of a century later, we're sitting here and we're still madly in love with each other. Listen, it pays to obey the Holy Ghost. But what is interesting is there was a book I had ordered from a general of the faith. His name is Norval Hayes. He's gone on to receive his re eternal reward, and he had written a book that was the compilation of everything that he had learned in his life. Norval Hayes was a gentleman who, in one service, went to pray for a lady in the back of the building who had been brought in on a wheelchair from a nursing home in Florida. A congregation of 1,000 people witnessed this. Her name was May Stafford. He went to lay hands on her, and before he could get to her, by the time he got from here to where that camera is, the Spirit of God hit that woman, picked her up out of the chair. She floated across the building, and as she floated across the building, her limbs snapped. She was twisted and curled up. She had to be put in the wheelchair, taken out. She had to be fed, taken to the restroom. She, her limbs began to twist and snap, and as the Spirit of God set her down, she was completely and totally healed from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. She, she, she wheeled her wheelchair back in to the nursing home, preached, got people healed there, and then started an evangelistic ministry traveling the country preaching on healing. One of our church members, if you ever come by and visit, you, you've met her. Her name is Sister Frances. She worked with May Stafford and traveled with her some and can tell you the truth of the story. Norval Hayes. Was the kind of man, you ever heard of Rod Parsley? Did you know he was a Baptist preacher? He was Baptist. No joke. Baptist and his sister was in a death, deadly car accident. They put her on enough pain medication to just keep her comfortable, and she became possessed by a devil. They heard of a man named Norval Hayes, took her there to where he was having a service. Norval Hayes wrapped his arms around Rod Parsley's sister and prayed for three hours until not only was that devil cast out of her, she was completely and totally healed. 
got a hold of that Baptist preacher and said, now give me your hands. The Lord's going to put his healing power in your hands. And got him, got him all full of that anointing. And that Baptist preacher went back to his church and said, if anything happened in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the book of Acts, it's going to happen here in this church. If you want to be healed, God put his healing power in my hand. Come down front. And an entire Baptist church was healed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's what gave birth to who you know as Rod Parsley. And you don't, you don't know that story. That was Norval Hayes. Norval Hayes was a businessman before he was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a wealthy, wealthy businessman to the point that after he was saved and sent into ministry, he never received an offering for himself. He only used his offerings to build orphanages and churches. And all he, he just lived off of his wealth. He'd be driving down the road. The Lord would tell him to pull off the side of the road and buy that hotel, and he'd buy the hotel. And then turn it around and then sell it and make a half a million dollars and then invest that in the kingdom. That's Norval Hayes. And he, he compiled his works together. We'll talk a little bit about him possibly here tonight in a book called How to Live and Not Die. And what's interesting about this book is this is the book that I'd ordered to go and see Miss Tara. I was in a room in South Carolina talking with some ministers, and I was sharing about this book because of what this revelation meant to me. Later on in his life, I got to spend time with Norval Hayes. I got to spend quality time with him and receive from him personally. It's amazing how the Lord will set those things up, you know. And he, he's, a funny, he's a funny man. Loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loved his neighbor. He was a servant first. And I was in a room talking about this amazing book, and one of the gentlemen in the room said, I'm actually friends with uh, the publishing company that publishes that book. Would you like to do a special edition of that book for just you and, you know, your congregation, that kind of thing? I said, that would be amazing. So we started talking, and the publisher said, well, forget doing it just kind of like your own version. Why don't we just republish the book? You write the introduction to it, and we'll just re-put the book out for the whole wide world. So we just got them out in the last month or so, How to Live and Not Die, republished. And I wrote, I wrote uh, in the introduction, Rod Parson wrote the forward, got Bill Winston to write in it, got, um, let's see, who else? Marilyn Hickey to write in it, Annette Capps to write in it, just some amazing, amazing generals of the faith to write in it. So if you're interested in how to live and not die, I want you to take a look at that. But go to, we'll come back to that, that's important, go to Luke chapter number 17, Luke chapter 17, and as you're turning there, just declare, I'm a Bible believer in Jesus' name, I'm a Bible believer. Hmm. I didn't mean one time. I mean, you know, you got to meditate on the word a little bit, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have had the tremendous privilege of working in an international prayer center. During that time, I prayed for more than 100,000 people one-on-one, individuals, not, not crowds, just one, one-on-one because when you're working – every single day praying for people for years, and you can you could accomplish that feat. And I've traveled across the world. I've ministered in behind the, the great wall, cyber wall of China and worked with the underground church in China. I've ministered in Pakistan. We have established more than 200 churches in Pakistan. I've been there and worked with the underground church there. Hallelujah. Uh, worked with the underground church in Israel and the ministry that's going on there in Israel. We do tremendous work there. And over that period of time, over a quarter of a century now, I've had the opportunity to see people pray for miracles again and again and again. And out of 100,000 people plus, I've seen some similarities between those who get Get their breakthrough and those who do not get their breakthrough. It's interesting as you begin to study the subject of prayer, it's amazing how much you realize you don't know the more that you know about it. But one of the things that I thought was fascinating over that time is to see that some people with certain characteristics consistently got miracles in their body, for their family, in their finances, and it had something to do with the subject of faith. Now, as someone who wasn't raised in church, I didn't know anything about that. I thought the red letters in the Bible were the words of the devil. I thought the the ribbon was the handle. I didn't know anything about the Bible, and so I'm just I'm just learning as I went. Uh, at the time, and I began to discover that there's something to this thing called faith. And I want to talk to you tonight about where you are in your faith life. 
Because the Bible says that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So if you want to overcome the world, what do you need? Hebrews 11.6 says that faith pleases God. For if any man comes to God, he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith pleases God. Do you realize that the only way that God feels pleasure is when you believe him? Spiritual warfare has been so hyped and sensationalized in the body of Christ to the point that we now have what I call faux warfare. It's like an RPG role-playing game where there's a lot of pretending going on, a lot of showmanship going on, and it sells a lot of T-shirts and jewelry and books. But I'm here to tell you right now, real spiritual warfare has to do with one thing. The enemy is trying to stop you from believing. That's spiritual warfare. The enemy's trying to get you out of faith. That's spiritual warfare. And I'm going to show you how propagandized we have become, especially in the South, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. We have become so propagandized to the point that if I were to talk about love, you all would nod your head the entire service. As I said, we don't have enough love. We don't have enough love. We need more love. You need more love in your life. And we would all agree, yes, how many of you agree, yes, we need more love in our lives? If I said we need more hope and preached on hope and say you're lacking hope and you need more hope, we would all nod our head and say, who doesn't need more hope? And how many of you would say we need more hope in our lives? Come on, help me, help me, help me. How many of you would say yes? But if I begin to say you need more faith in your life, immediately something gets triggered in you. This pride rises in your heart, and you begin to say, who are you to question my faith? As if your faith is above reproach? How is it your love life is not above reproach, your hope life is not above reproach, but your faith life, that is above reproach? Don't you dare question someone's faith. Now, I would agree with you on principle, you should never question someone's faith. You ought to question your own, though. What I'm about to share with you is never to be used for you to look at someone else because you have no idea where they are in their faith journey. There's no way for you to know. Some people may never see a breakthrough in the natural while you're looking at them, and you've seen breakthrough after breakthrough, and it takes them more faith to get up in the morning and to go through their day with that problem than it does you to get the miracle that you had or whatever problem you were facing. This is not a point for you to look at someone else. I'm just letting you know how propagandized we've become to the point that we can never talk about faith because because everybody gets, ooh, don't talk about that. We're so muddled and mixed up to the point that we will tell you never to question someone's faith, and you shouldn't, while at the same time we will question God, and we will say it must have been the Lord's will to kill that person because they believed. Wait a second, I thought we weren't supposed to, question, we weren't supposed to judge someone's faith. And you will hear the experiential theologians of our day, you understand experiential theology is not like biblical theology. If you're a Bible believer, you believe the Bible, no matter what your experience says. Experiential theology is when you base what the Bible means off of what you have experienced. Well, I know the Bible says with his stripes we are healed. I know the Bible says that Jesus healed all who came to him. I know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. But Sister May May, she prayed and she didn't get healed, so it must have been the Lord's will for her to die. Pastor Allen, I know she believed. I know she believed because she served in children's ministry for 25 years. And you are guilty of the very thing you would condemn anyone else of doing. You are judging her faith. I'm here to tell you today, you don't have many problems. You have one problem. It's a faith problem. Whatever you're facing, it is in some way tied to faith. Now, if you really want to bake your noodle, take a look at Andrew Womack's teaching on doubt. It'll it'll turn your world upside down. This is the victory that overcomes the world. This is why the enemy fights it. This is not, if you ever get to a point when thinking about faith, measuring your faith, wondering whether or not you have what it takes to conquer this mountain, if you ever get to the point where you are in condemnation, 
or you are condemning others, you are in error. Can we just have an honest, because I came here tonight prepared to have an honest conversation with you and just to get real with you, and let's have some real discipleship, and let's just remove all of the, you know, the barriers, the walls that come up, like, what do you mean, faith? What do you mean I don't have enough faith? Let's just, let's just re- don't assume that you're going to be condemned because you're not going to be condemned. You're going to be built up. You're going to be encouraged. But I'm here to tell you, you do not have many problems. You have one problem. It is a faith problem. Because all things are possible Hmm. to him that wishes, wants it really bad, to him who believes. But I knew something. Stop. Let's just have an honest conversation. Bring the walls down. Let's forget about who you knew. And let's see what God has to say about the subject. And I'm telling you, it will produce a breakthrough in your life. Are you in Luke chapter 17? If you're not there, you're probably never going to get there. I was just giving you time to turn there. Luke 17, hallelujah. Hmm. I feel that again tonight, growths are going to dissipate and disappear in Jesus' name. We're going to go to Luke 17, and we're going to start with verse number 5. Luke 17 and verse number 5. If you're there, say yes. And the apostles said unto the Lord, and look at this. Why don't you read those three words? One more time. Lord, would you do that? Would you do that? If this is the victory that overcomes the world, if you increase our faith, our victory increases. Our ability to overcome increases. Lord, we ask you now. Now I want you to see the reply of Jesus because it's very interesting. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you should say unto this sycamine tree. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of mine. (laughs) Come on, look at somebody else at your table and say, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of mine. Don't act like you ain't sick of nothing, sick of this job, sick of this pay, sick of this pain in my body, sick of this person saying, no, okay, no. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say unto this sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Here's what he says. If you have faith, As what? What does that mean? That is a traditional understanding. Very little. A little bit of faith can accomplish a whole lot of stuff. How many of you know that's true? Hallelujah. You don't need a lot of faith. You need a little faith. But how many of you know the Bible says that God has dealt to every man. Now, here's a fascinating passage of Scripture. The measure of faith. Yes, is that a Bible first or do I have a trick Bible? God has dealt to every man the what? That means that faith is measurable. Hmm. So God has given every man the measure of faith. Let me throw a few verses at you. They don't have to turn there. I'm just going to give them to you for your own personal study. Romans 12, 3 says that everyone has the measure of faith. Matthew 8, 27 through 30, Jesus said, O ye of little faith. Matthew 8, 10, he speaks of great faith. 1 Timothy 1, 19 speaks of shipwrecked faith. Faith. 2 Corinthians 10.15 says your faith can be increased. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 says that your faith can be perfected when you are lacking in your faith. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says that your faith can grow exceedingly. So that means you are not doomed to the current level of faith that you possess. Faith can increase. This is fascinating to me. So here we see in the Bible there are those with little faith. Yes. And then there are those with great faith. We've all, but we've all been given the measure of faith. And if we have faith as a grain of 
mustard seed, we can say to the sycamine. Another verse says you can say to this mountain. We'll get to that here in a moment. So what are we dealing with here? We are not just referring to the size of the faith that you possess. We are talking about the process of faith that you pursue. I'm about to fix you if you will pay attention just for a few more minutes here. We are not just talking about the size of faith. If you had faith as a grain of mustard, if you will see faith as a seed, then you will see that it can grow, it can increase, it can multiply, and it can be choked. The parable of the soul in Mark chapter number 4 gives us an outline of different kinds of soil. Some is sown by the wayside who hear the word of God, and they, it's, it's a wayside issue, and the, and the fowls of the air come and eat it up. Some are sown among stony ground, and they have no root in themselves. And some are sown among thorns, and it grows up, and it chokes the life out of it so that it can produce no fruit. But some is sown on good ground. But even in the good ground, there's variation. 30, 60, 100. What if what you need to get your breakthrough isn't 30-fold? Did you know that believers can successfully produce 30-fold faith and still not get their miracle? Huh. This is something to think about. So now we see faith then through a different lens when we understand that we've all been given the measure, but have you noticed it seems that some operate at a higher level? Are they special? Were they given something different? Or did they do something different with what they were given? If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. So if you see the measure of faith you've been given as a seed that I must plant, that I must water, that I must protect, that I must keep the fowls of the air away, that I must keep the thorns and the thistles from growing around it, then it's going to begin to grow and produce some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Hmm. People often come to me and say, I need you to pray for me. It's kind of like an instant thing. Pray for me. Lay hands on me. I need healing. And my reaction is, well, I don't know if I'm ready to pray for you. I, I, I don't know if you're ready for me to pray for you. I don't know, where is your faith at? Where, where, what are you believing? And sometimes, sometimes you can try to pray for someone else and your faith is at a greater place than theirs at that moment. You've got to learn to meet people. This is not a point of condemnation. You just have to learn to meet people where they are. One of the most self-defeating things you can do that can frustrate you and burn you out as a minister or as a Christian who's trying to minister to people is you're trying to believe for things for people that they're not prepared to believe for nor are they hungry for, nor are they interested in. And you're trying to force it on them because you're forcing the ideal instead of trying to figure out how do we, how do we meet them where they are. Find out where they are. You know, when you find one of those maps in the mall, if you're going to get to where you want to go, the first thing you got to do is find out where you are. And there's a map that says you are here. <laughs> there have been times in my life, I can tell you, when I had the faith knocked out of me. You ever had that happen before? And when that happened, I'm, I, this, you just have to say, you know what? It's time to put to work the word of the living God. And I remember one time I had gotten a bad diagnosis from the doctor, and I went into my office with a couple of jugs of water, and I closed the door and said, I'm not coming out until I get a breakthrough. And I can tell you when there's pain in your body, believing and speaking the word of God is one thing. Anybody can sing a tune on a clear day at noon, but I want to know, do you have a song to sing at midnight when there's trouble all around? It's one thing to pray and believe and you know, everything's hunky-dory when it's somebody else you're believing for, but what about when your body is racked with pain, when your finances are depleted, when the eviction notice is on your door, what do you do then? That's where the rubber meets the road. So I put on some preaching tapes. I'm talking about cassette tapes. That's, if you want good preaching, you need cassette tapes. And I put on some cassette tapes. I started, I sat down and I laid down in a little couch that I had in my office and with pain through my body. And I started listening to those cassette tapes and the preaching. And I tell you, I was just frustrated. And you know, when you get, when you, even when you know what you ought to do, when somebody tries to encourage you or tell you what you ought to do, you get frustrated. Even if it's the right thing. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, you know, Ugh. 
and sitting there, and they're preaching. And I listened to that same message, message probably four times. After about three and a half, four hours, something turned over on the inside of me, and I said, amen. And then I said, praise God. Something jumped on the inside of me. What's happening? Faith comes by hearing. So when Jesus talks about in the parable of Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower, he says, the sower sows the word, right? That's the interpretation. The sower sows the word. What's the harvest, though? What's 30, what's 60, what's 100 volt? Well, what happens when the word is sown? Faith comes. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the so actually, when we're talking about 30, 60, 100 fold in Mark chapter 4, it's talking about faith. Hmm. Something to meditate on and think about. And after hearing the word for three and a half, four hours, over and over, it started to leap on the inside of me. My baby started to jump, so to speak, you know. And then I began to get up with the pain still in my body, began to get up and kind of just hobble around in the name of Jesus. Holly, yes, that's right. I believe I receive my healing in Jesus' name. I believe I receive my healing in Jesus' name. I believe I receive my healing in Jesus' name. The power of God hit me so strong, I went back to the doctor, they could find no trace of the thing that they said was in my body. Hallelujah. Well, I guess if it was your miracle, you'd clap a little more, you know. I understand, I understand. This applies to every single area of our lives. If you will treat faith as a seed. Now, what we, what we have been damaged by is kind of the Reformed Calvinistic view that says if God wants you to have it, he'll give it to you. And there couldn't be anything more stupid and I'm trying to be as polite as possible, then that concept, God wants you to have it, he'll give it to you. Huh? God wants you to brush your teeth today, he would have brushed your teeth. Golly, I mean, how dumb can you get? If God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. What world, what planet are you living on? Have you ever read the Bible? And that's the problem because people will hear like faith teaching and say that's not in the Bible. And my response is, no, you're not in the Bible. Because if you were in the Bible, it becomes apparent that there are many things that God desires for us to have, but there are many things that are keeping those things from manifesting in our life, including an enemy, a satanic force that is trying to thwart his plans in the earth. Go to Numbers, chapter number 14. Numbers 14. Hallelujah. As you turn there, just say, i got to have faith, faith, faith. Numbers is a terrifying book. The, the intention of the book of Numbers is to revive the fear of God in the hearts of believers. If you will read the book of Numbers without understanding and know that in the book of Hebrews, it says that all these things were done for examples for us, lest we fall by the same manner of unbelief. Interesting. That's in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 3, verse 8, that he doesn't want us to fall the same way they fail in the book of Numbers. So as we go here to Numbers chapter 13, well, excuse me, yeah, let's do, let's do 13. I'm giving them a run for their money back there. Numbers 13 and verse 30. Let's, start, let's try that first. Number 13, verse 30. How many of you know just from a cursory Bible school study that God's intention was for them to go into the promised land? Yes? Was it God's will for them to enter into the promised land? Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says in verse 30 of chapter 13, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome this land, to possess the promised land. Verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report. Now we go to chapter number 14. And verse number 1, chapter 14, verse number 1, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel, what, 
murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we had died in the wilderness? Wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey, were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Verse number 28, the Lord is speaking here. Say unto them, the Lord is saying to Moses, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you, your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness. You got to take some time to read these things and understand the context. I would ask you again, was it the will of God for them to go into the promised land? Did he do miraculous things to get them out of bondage? Did they make it to the promised land? Two made it. Two made it. Out of millions, two. What was the difference between the two that made it and the millions who didn't? What they said. Faith. Because Jesus said, if you had faith, you would say. Now, that's an interesting thing to meditate on. Jesus says, if you have faith, if you want to know what faith looks like, he tells you, if you had faith, you would say some things. Some of you got to learn to open that mouth for something other than gossip. You got to learn to open that mouth for something other than cussing. Got to open that mouth for something other than, well, I'll stop there. Amen. Amen. It was God's will for them to go in. It's his desire. And if God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. No. You're going to have to fight for it. In fact, when they went into the land of Egypt, the Bible said that God even, uh, into the land of the promised land, God even left some enemies in that land so that they would have to learn how to fight. Now, let me deposit this into your spirit very, very quickly. When we're talking about miracle signs and wonders, when we're talking about believing for the will of God to be manifested, and I would assume in a room like this with people as well taught as you, it doesn't need to be said that you can't go to believing for something that God has not promised in his word. Amen? Amen. You can't go believing to be president of the United States if God hadn't called you to be president of the United States. Yes. You can't, you can't go believing to be a successful crack dealer on the corner down the road and start praying and believing and praying and believing that I'm going, to be, I'm going to be the best crack dealer in the city of Salisbury. Now, you can, but God ain't going to partner with you on that, you know. When you start to understand the law of faith and the way faith works, the power of words, which could be an entirely separate conversation, you will understand that words are so powerful that you don't even need to be doing what God wants you to do, and you could still potentially accomplish something just through the power of your confession. Read Genesis chapter 11 in the building of the Tower of Babel if you don't believe that. So there is power. God has placed within humanity power and certain principles that work. You can see people don't even know the Lord who work these things. But I, tonight, I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about learning how to partner with God in order to receive something that he has designed and desires for you to possess in your life. And I'm here to tell you, he designed and desired for you to be healed. It is not his will for you to have cancer in your body. It is not his will for you to have diabetes in your body. It is not his will for you to have sickness or disease in your body, a growth on your body, pain in your back. It is the will of God for you to be healed. But if you're going to receive it, you're going to have to operate in faith. 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 This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. I was in a service And one of my jobs during this, we were doing miracle healing and victory services. And one of my jobs before the service, thousands of people would come from all across the country and around the world to these services. And one of my jobs was to meet people ahead of time and to vet them and to see what they were believing for if it was a legitimate need or a legitimate miracle. I remember meeting a man named Bill. Bill was hit by a train when he was riding a motorcycle. How many of you know that will mess you up? 
Bill was hit by a train while running a motorcycle. He was blind in one eye, losing vision in the other. He was on 35 prescribed medications a day, a diabetic. He was uh, a quadriplegic. He had been paralyzed, if I'm not mistaken, for 15 years to the point that his muscle had atrophied in his legs, unable to do anything on his own, had a, had a uh, assistance dog who was with him every moment of every single day. His name was Baron. That was the name of the dog. And I remember when he wheeled into that service, Fred and skinny, and the moment the power of God hit that service, he lived in Massachusetts. He had traveled hundreds of miles to get there. He said, if I can just get there in the name of Jesus, if I can get in the building in the name of Jesus, I know that I know that I shall be made whole. Sounds a lot like the woman with the issue of blood, doesn't it? If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know that I shall be made whole. And he pushed through the crowds, and he pushed through all the pain and the problems needed, the finances in order to get in the building. I met him before the service, and I was watching. I saw what happened. Happened. When the glory of God hit him, Bill got up out of his wheelchair for the first time in 15 years, walked up 10 stairs, took off his eye patch, and was completely healed. Thank you, Jesus. Went back to his hometown. They put him on the front page of the paper because everybody knew him. It said, the miracle man walketh. I, know him, I began to know him well because he moved from where he was then at that time, moved to that church, began to work at that church, had to keep his dog with him because once those dogs get attached, you can't. But he didn't so much as take a, a, med, a, 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 a Tylenol after that or an aspirin. Took the patch off, vision was completely restored, diabetic, no more, totally healed, walking around, glory be to his name forever. But what did he do? He operated in faith. And it can look like a million different things. It doesn't always look the same, you know. But faith always has action attached to it and always has words attached to it. Let's, let's go to Luke, I believe. Let's go to Luke. No, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, very quickly. Hallelujah. Can you just bless the Lord as we're turning there? Just love on him. Thank him for his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God forever. Hmm. Man, I don't know. I don't know. What time do y'all normally get out of here? <laughs> you liar. <laughs> Well, we want to listen to them for sure. We want them to maintain their sanity as long as humanly possible. Praise God. Hmm. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 11 then. It's funny because um, they had asked me before the service, are there, are there any verses that you, do you know what verses you plan on going to? And then I proceeded to show them about 10 pages of verses such a wonderful subject. The Lord is so good to place this kind of system in the earth where you can't buy God. You know, you can't buy him. You can't cajole him. You can't manipulate him. No one has any greater reach in his eyes to him than any other person. The, it is a level playing field where we are all at the same place and have the same capacity. We can all please him by just trusting him. And trust is the greatest gift we could ever give God. And after all, that's what faith is, isn't it? Trust. 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 Not needing to see. Trust. Hallelujah. Trust. Trust. What I wanted you to get in your spirit earlier before whatever tangent we went on was that when we're talking about the miraculous healing signs and wonders, and I want you to get this down, the reason why we pray for miracles is to please God because Jesus suffered for it. He died for it. He rose for it to provide it for us. 
And so we press against anything that violates what he has promised us. In the same, it is true with sin, isn't it? That he has freed us from the bondages of sin. He has set us free from the captivity of iniquity. And yet we struggle with it. And what we must not do in that struggle is concede the ground and say, well, it must be the Lord's will for me to have this sin in my life because I know it says that I'm that he's given me power over sin and given me the grace of God to overcome sin. I know it says that, but I still struggle with it. No, no, no. In order to please him, we fight against that sin, don't we? As best as we can, imperfectly, often, yes, but as best as we can, we are fighting against it with no condemnation because we know we live in a fallen world. Why don't we look at sickness the same way? That we are called to press against it, to battle it, to understand the evil, destructive, demonic nature that it is, the suffering that it brings, and we press against And we know we live in a fallen world, and it's imperfect, and we won't always see breakthrough, but we're not doing it to see breakthrough. We're doing it to honor him. If you are praying and your sole purpose is just to feel better, you will give up and get frustrated. But if you're praying and you realize just me praying is honoring him and pleasing him, and that's what I want to do with my life. I want to please him. You'll never give up. You'll never surrender. You'll never give in. You'll never look to see and and then get discouraged when you don't see because you're just going to keep pressing and keep pressing and keep pressing and keep pressing to please him. Hallelujah. So when you begin your journey to, to healing, do not think that getting healed is the end of that journey. Are you in are you in Mark chapter 11? Praise God. Let's do Mark chapter 11. I've I've put you all over the place. I know we were going to go to Matthew, but let's do Mark because I'm running out of time, and I want to be able to talk to you a little more. Hallelujah. If we'll still be able to do what we were thinking about doing, we may have a time of Q&A where I can just talk to you and tell you, and you can ask a question, and I can say, I don't know. (laughs) I don't have a clue. Hallelujah. That's always fun. Do you know the story of Mark chapter 11? Jesus has, they were walking by, and the Bible said that they, Jesus saw a fig tree afar off, and he was a hunger, yes. And he leaves the disciples, and he goes afar off to the fig tree, and they hear him from a distance cursing that tree. And he curses that tree, and then they leave and go into the temple, and that's a whole other story unto itself. They come back by the temple, and Peter, or one of the disciples, says to him, Lord, the fig tree you cursed, it's withered up and died. And Jesus said, that's right, boys, that's one of the benefits of being me. <laughs> Look at verse number 21. Look at verse number 21. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus, answering, saith unto him, I'm Jesus, and this is the benefits of being Jesus. Is that what he said? Or does he proceed now to include them into? Here's what he says. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. The amount of revelation packed into this verse is beyond our ability to unpack in hundreds of hours of teaching. There is as much truth and life-transforming revelation here as there is in John 3, 16. Now here it says, verse 23, Verily I say unto you that what? Who? In fact, leave that verse up there a little while. That who? 
Everybody in the building? There was a pastor whose child was diagnosed with severe autism, unable. They told him, your child will never communicate. Your child will never talk to you. Your child will never know you are his father. And he was down in his room, and he was studying Mark 11, 22 to 24, and he's reading it. And as he's reading it, he gets to the word whosoever, and it's almost as if it jumps off the page and gets on him. And he began to realize, wait a second, I am a whosoever. I am a whosoever. This verse includes me. I am a whosoever. And in the name of Jesus, I declare that my son shall be healed. Today, he is, he is graduated from college. He's dating a beautiful woman. I'm telling you, the Lord will do mighty, mighty miracles for you if you'll recognize that you are a whosoever. Let's dissect this verse just for a moment. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and look at this, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall Believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Stop. Believe what? Shall believe that those things which who says? The whosoever. The whosoever has to believe that whatsoever comes out of his mouth. It didn't say believe what God says. That's baked into it. That's what he started it with, have faith in God. So it starts with have faith in God, and then he tells you what that looks like. Are you listening to me? What does it look like? Can I come out here? What does it look like to have faith in God? Verse 23 shows you what it looks like to have faith in God. Because if you have faith in God, you'll start talking to inanimate objects. Yes? Have faith in God, and you'll start talking to the mountain, and then here's the requirement. You have to believe that what you say will come to pass. That's wild. That's wild. Now, this is not a trick Bible. This is, this is what's in the Bible. You've got to believe that what you say comes to pass. So here's a question. What keeps you from believing what you say comes to pass? What diabolical scheme from the enemy has been perpetrated on you to get you to doubt your own prayers? What has he done throughout your life to harm you, to traumatize you, to abuse you, to set you up, to get you to a place that when you pray, you even doubt the words that are coming out of your mouth, whether or not God's even hearing those words? But Jesus said this is a requirement. You must believe that what you say. And if you will believe that what you say comes to pass, you will have whatever you say. For what things soever you desire when you pray, if you believe that you receive them, then you shall have them. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, that's not faith. That's not faith. What do you need faith for? If you see it, you don't need faith. It's there. It's in front of you. You have sight. When you have sight, you don't need faith. Most people think that faith, faith is the opposite of fear, and that is not true. Fear is faith. It's the same animal. Fear is just faith in the wrong direction, but it still is faith. Fear is the belief that the worst is going to happen. That's what fear is. It is is an intense belief. It is so strong that it affects your physiology. It changes your body, and it even shortens your life. And we all understand the power of fear and its ability to incapacitate people, but what about the power of faith? So the opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is sight. Did you receive it? And they go, well, I don't know. Let me see. That's why... I will never pray when people come to me and they say, will you pray for me to get a good report from the doctor? No! I'm not going to pray for you to get a good report from the doctor. I'm going to pray for you to be healed regardless of what the doctor says. (laughs) Why in the world would I hitch my prayer to some... 
Have you seen the, the, the witchcraft that's been going on in the medical community over the last three years? Why would I hitch the success of my prayer to whatever it is they have to say? They see you in the room there. They go out of the room and they Google it to see what's going on with your life. They don't know. No, statistics were done. A large percentage of doctors will leave the exam room and then Google the symptoms you gave them to try to figure out what's going on in your life. It's true. There are more than 200,000 malpractice deaths in the United States every single year. People talk about, oh, these faith preachers, you know, what about somebody who prayed and they died? What about the 200,000 who went to the doctor and died? What about them? Those news reporters, you know, that 2020 report, 60 Minutes ain't waiting outside that doctor's office trying to catch him in his private jet. No, they ain't doing that. And thank God for doctors. Because, listen, if it is God's will to heal, then you ought to do everything possible to get healed. Yes? If it's God's will to heal, nutritionally do everything you can. Go to the doctor. Do everything that you can. But hear the voice of the Holy Ghost and do what he says. I personally know a girl named Bethany. Bethany was born without optic nerves. She has no optic nerves. If you don't know, you can't see without optic nerves. Totally blind, brought into a service where faith was being preached. We laid hands on her. She was supernaturally healed, and she has perfect vision right now, Bethany. And she went back to the doctor, and she still has no optic nerves. So we're going to keep waiting on a good report from the doctor? She can see even though she has no optic nerves. Will you pray for me to get a good report? No, I'm not going to pray for you to get a good report. I'm going to pray you get healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, regardless of what the doctor says. And if you're in the medical community, you are doing God's work. Do not mistake what I'm saying. We need every single person we can loving on people and caring for them and praying for them. And if you've ever had a nurse who knew God, if you ever had a doctor who knew God, you know the difference that it makes. Brother Norval, his daughter, Zona, her name's Zona. What a name, Zona. She had 40, he talks about this in the book, she had 42 growths on her body that were busted and bleeding, causing pain when she was a teenager. All over her, all over her hands and arms, 42 growths. And you could imagine the, 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 the work that that does on the mind of a, of a young girl going to school and what she's having to deal with, having bleeding, busting growths on her body. He prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, heal my daughter. Lord, would you heal my daughter? Lord, I know you can heal. Would you heal my daughter? Lord, I pray, would you heal my daughter? He prayed that for five years. His daughter backslid because she was looking at the circumstances and wondering why isn't something happening visually. He came home one day after ministry and walked into his living room, and we stepped on the carpet of his living room. All of a sudden, he was taken up to heaven. And believe it or not, but I believe wisdom is justified by her children. And you can understand the validity of a visitation, number one, based on its reliance and fidelity to the word of God, and two, was the name of Jesus glorified after that visitation. He was taken up into heaven, and there he met Jesus, and Jesus was not happy. He was very stern, very loving, very kind, but very stern, and Jesus looked at him in heaven, and I want you to hear this question. Let it resound in your ears. Jesus said, how long are you going to put up with those growths on your daughter's body? He had been praying for five years, but it's not enough to pray, ladies and gentlemen, you have to pray according to the word. You can't just pray your own little desperate prayer, begging and hoping that if you can get God to understand how desperate you are, that's what you call, what do we call that? The negotiator's prayer. The negotiator's prayer, number one, says, God, if you do this, then I'll do that. You ever done that before? God, if you do this, then I'll do that. Because God, if God, if I can give him something, if I can offer him something of value, then maybe he'll give me what I want. That's not how God operates. He operates by faith. Now, when negotiations go sideways, then you have the blackmail prayer. And the blackmail prayer is when you say, God, if you don't do this, I'm never going back to church again. And God will not be blackmailed. He does not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Just try and see how it works for you. 
You're going to hear nothing from heaven, and you're not going to go to church, and you're just going to barrel down this whole path of darkness. But then there's something called the pity prayer. And, Lord, if I, if I could just get God to know how desperate my situation is, then he'll have to move. No, 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 no. Desperation does not move God. If it did, then Africa would be one of the most blessed places on the planet. It's not need that moves God. It's faith that moves God. And he had been offering these pity prayers, Lord, would you please heal? Lord, would you please do that? Trying to get God to do something God had already done on the cross 2,000 years ago. You will get burnt out and frustrated any time you try to get God to do something he's already done. Taken up into heaven, and Jesus looked at him and said, how long are you going to put up with those gross on your daughter's body? And he thought to himself, put up with these gross. I've been praying for healing. And Jesus sternly said, you're the head of your house. If you'll curse it and believe and not doubt, those gross will die and disappear from her body. And he began to descend back to the earth. And Jesus kindly and graciously said, believe and not doubt, son. Believe and not doubt. He came back to himself there in his living room. Her, Zona, his daughter, was upstairs with a friend in her bedroom. They were talking about something, and he started to run upstairs, and he thought, no, I don't, I don't want to embarrass her, you know. And she's up there with a friend. I'll wait until the friend leaves, or, or I'll wait until tomorrow. And then he started thinking about it. He said, wait a second. That's that dumb devil. He's trying to get me to stop praying. Have you ever been held back by something like that, caring what people think? And that, That's the devil. you got to learn. God has to change your reaction because there's change in reaction. If you want to miracle from heaven, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. Your old, same old religious little praise or hallelujah is not going to get you across the finish line. You've got to find your Bartimaeus. You've got to find the woman with the issue of blood on the inside of you. You've got to find that thing on the inside of you that will push through the crowd, jump up, cry even the louder in order to get a hold of your breakthrough. So he began to run upstairs, kick the door open to her bedroom, and said, Zona! And they're like, what's the matter with you? She said, what's the matter with you, Daddy? He said, I've just come from heaven. <laughs> just come from heaven. The Lord Jesus told me, Zona, that I'm the head of my house, and if I'll curse these growths, they'll die and disappear. Do you believe that, Bobby, her friend that was sitting right there? Do you believe that? He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, whatever you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, whatever you say. He said, in Jesus' name, I curse those gross. I command them to die and disappear. I'm the head of my house. I have authority here. I command you to leave now. Now, I want you to pay attention to your doubt-filled mind that's been trained in the art of unbelief because the first thing you say is, what happened? It doesn't matter what happened. We're doing this to please the Lord. See, that, that thing in your mind that says, what happened? What are you doing? Look, 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 look. That's the opposite of faith. You have to know that you know deep down on the inside of you that when the word of God is declared with authority, it is done. And I don't need to see nothing. And I can tell you right there in that moment, nothing happened. But he knew sometimes you cross that Mark eleven twenty two to 24 threshold. You cross that threshold that says, I believe I receive when I pray. It is done. And there's nothing that can deter you. Something gets deposited on the inside of you. And you know that you know that you know that it is done. And he began to walk around his house and just sing, and he can't even sing. He can't carry a tune in the bucket. But he would just say, thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you that my daughter's body is healed. Thank you that it's done. He did this day after day after day over and and over and over again to the point that his daughter was going crazy. She said, Daddy, you got to stop doing that. You're driving me insane. And he would go, thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. She stopped him on day 30 and said, Dad, would you stop doing that? Would you look, look, look? Would you look? I am not healed. I had 42 growths yesterday, 42 the day before that, 42. Would you look? And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Look, 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 look. You're not healed. You're not being blessed. It's not working for you. Look, 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 look. And your response needs to be the same as his. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord, that I'm the head of my house. I curse those growths and they have to die. Thank you, Lord, for healing my daughter's body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. On the 40th day, he heard 
a tussle like a wardrobe had fallen over in her bedroom, and she screamed, and she came running out of her bedroom. She said, Daddy, this is spooky. This is scary stuff. This is strange. This is weird. He said, what's the matter with you? She said, look, they're all gone. Every single growth is gone. It's like skin like a baby and oil on her skin, like the anointing oil of God on her skin. And they stood there in his kitchen and lifted their hands and began to worship the Lord God, our healer, who had come through in such a tight spot to bring a breakthrough and a miracle because they believed. Stand up on your feet. Listen to me. You're the head of your house. You have authority. And I don't want you to ever doubt for a minute that it is God's will for you. And I don't want it, don't ever get in a place of condemnation. Never think, well, I just don't have enough faith. Yes, you do. You have the measure of faith. Let me show you how much faith you have if you're born again. You believe you're going to a place you've never seen, to be with a man you've never personally met in the flesh. You believe that you are going to be raised from the dead, that your body is going to be transfigured and you're going to be completely saved and delivered. You believe that you're going to walk on streets of gold. Don't let the devil lie to you and say you don't have faith. You have some crazy faith. Lift those hands to heaven right now. Lift those hands to heaven. What are you believing for? I'm here to tell you right now, the breakthrough is within your reach. And I'm going to ask you, how long are you going to put up with that infirmity? How long are you going to put up with that ailment, that sickness, that pain, that poverty, that lack? How long are you going to put up with it? You are the head of your house. I feel such an anointing here, such an anointing.